All right, without further ado, let's get to tonight's awesome event and tonight's awesome speaker. We have Steve Portigal here. He's a user research expert. He's a principal at Portigal Consulting. He wrote this great book called Interviewing Users, How to Uncover Compelling Insights, and that's his specialty. He also hosts a great podcast called Dollars to Donuts. Um, his, hash, his Twitter symbol is at Steve Portigal. I forgot to mention on the raffle side, I went too fast. The way you win the raffle is to tweet, okay? So you need to basically follow at Lean Prod Meetup. That's why we've got all these up here. <laughs> follow at Lean Prod Meetup. And then just send a tweet, um, basically. And if you know, you can take pictures of slides that you like or quotes that you like. And again, just put hashtags in. So we'll be giving away five copies of his book uh, at the end. Then we'll have Q and A at the end too. So without further ado, let's welcome Steve Portugal. Thanks, everyone. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm mic Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, I appreciate everyone coming tonight, and uh, uh, Dan and the volunteers for organizing. This is pretty amazing. It's just uh, lots going on, great community building, and you see how much work it takes. So thanks, you guys, for that. Uh, and our sponsors, who for made it possible for me to be here, and all of us, I guess. And I was interested to hear the sponsors. Some of them deal with the topic of user research in different ways, and it just made me think about you know, sort of framing what I'm going to talk about today. I mean, user research is a broad topic. There's as many methods as there are, whatever bad metaphor that I won't, I won't flesh out. But there's lots and lots of approaches. Um, and so today is kind of a deep dive into one or one, one collection of approaches. What I think uh, you'll get out of it is stuff on how to do the thing that I'm talking about. But embedded within everything that I'm describing are sort of other principles that will ladder up that can be applied to other kinds of things. So, um, you know, if you start to have that, uh, and we all have this when we start listening to someone like, oh, that's not really, like, I don't do that, or I don't know that, or that's not what's happening for me right now. You know, I'd say, like, acknowledge that feeling and just look for what, uh, what are things that you can apply. Because I think, you know, research is diverse. But at its core, we're trying to understand something in a fresh way so that we can do something differently. So when I talk about interviewing this activity, um, which I said is still is broad, there's a lot of different pieces to it. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of uh, terminology for methods thrown around, and there's new fashionable terms that come in and out. Um, and so one way, just to cut through the jargon, is to offer a sort of a a definition-like thing. Uh, so let me talk about what I mean when I talk about doing research, user research, interviewing users, kind of where I'm oriented. Um, this, this idea of examining people in their context. And so two things to call out here. One is examining people, which is a horrible phrase, but it's meant to be agnostic. I don't know what we're doing with them, but there's something where we're going to look at them. Uh, and the piece that I highlighted here in context, I think that's really key to what I'm going to be talking about. Um, you can fake context, you can do, you can, you know, work around it, but there's a really magical thing that only happens if you go out of where you live and into somebody's weird, strange, uh, confounding environment and have an experience there. Uh, and so that, that kind of leads to, sorry, let me, let me hold on here. I think a thing when people approach doing research, they ask, they think, well, we're just going to ask, what are people doing? Uh, and the cool thing about research, depending on your methods, but you can get what it means to them for free. If you ask somebody, you know, how often does this happen, or you know, where did you get this from, they will tell you what that means to them. And that is, understanding that meaning is often the necessary trigger that you need to kind of explore in order to get over the, um, the inertia of how people are doing things today. So meaning is there for free if you're willing to, to hear it. Um, you have to make some sense of the data, right? We're not just scooping up feature requests. We are having a messy human experience that we have some methodology and structure around. And then we have to infer, interpret, synthesize, uh, and, and, uh, and, and take the experience that we're having and bring that back. Uh, and so, I, to me, the things that are sort of, if you are a scientist who's used to working with test tubes and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, physical models of things, the, the softer side of user research can be really intimidating, but I think it's, uh, those are its advantages. The experiences that we have that change us out in the world 
give us fresh ways of looking at things and let us see problems, opportunities, needs, behaviors in ways we haven't before. And, and it's that thing that happens to us is where the, the value and, and the, the whole outcomes for, for the research comes from. Um, and the last thing is just do something with it. Uh, research sometimes sits and you have to set up research and execute it in a way that it ties to what needs to get done. There's probably a, a talk and a book that we could do about that, which so that I'm just going to leave that there. You guys know that, and I'm not going to dig into the specifics of it. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of fancy words that are sort of slightly beyond uh, my vocabulary around, you know, formative and summative and generative and evaluative. Let's just say at any sort of process you have to make a thing, you can do research. You can do this kind of research at all sorts of different points in the process. So you can try to figure out what you're going to make or do by looking at what's going on in the world. You can take some idea that you've represented in some way, and you know, that could be a wireframe or a storyboard or whatever kind of thing it is, a, a presentation deck. It's an idea. And so when you do research, you are learning about the world in order to think about your idea, which is different than testing your product. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, you've been out in the marketplace and you have a, a user base, you have a, the world's been changed because your thing exists. You can also look very broadly at how, is the, how are those activities being done now in order to think about where to go forward. So here's um, you know, a processy looking thing around what, what, what does research look like. It's sort of four, uh, it's four chunks. Uh, who are we going to talk to? What do we want to do with them? field work, the thing we're going to do to learn from them, and then doing something with the data. So I'll sort of use this to, to chunk up the talk. Yeah, so we'll talk about the first two together. Um, so this is really staging, planning, you know, what, what is the problem? What are we going to do? What are we trying to learn? And why? Uh, so let me introduce this notion of the business question and the research question here. Um, this is a redacted trends deck that uh, someone, some people in the room might recognize, but maybe not. Uh, this is from an entertainment ingredient, a technology ingredient company. And so they had done some kind of work. I don't, I don't even know what the context for this deck was. And I, I took away anything that was sensitive. But, um, and then I just made up stuff on top of it. So this isn't really a reflection on them. Although I do like that they had a bullet point about larger global trends that was just China exclamation mark. Like, you know, China. Um, so the business question are things that the business asks in order to think about what might be done differently. So what new products and services are you going to offer to create stickiness? Uh, you know, what entertainment activities are you going to support for the Chinese middle class that's growing? Again, I'm making these up, but that's a business question, right? We want to understand something that we're going to do differently with our business. That's different than... The research question. The research is, what are you going to learn in order to help answer the business question? So what are the motivations and frustrations for current users of our platform? Or what's changing in middle class Chinese family life? What uh, technologies and what analog solutions are being used? And then what comes out of that is a research method. In order to answer that research question, we're going to use these tools and do this and do that uh, in some combination. So it's, it's all well and good for me to stand here with a slide deck with a clicker and just kind of suggest that here's the business question, then there's the research question, and then the methods. Like it, so yes, that's true, but in my experience, they never come into your life like that. Um, and so I think it's your job to understand all three of those and their relationship. And certainly what happens to me is if I'm given one, I've got to like go back up or go back down to try to get all of them and understand their relationship. I also don't mean that um, you know you, it's a it's a it's a gate, right? We well we can't start doing research until we understand completely what the business question is. So too much of a, of a of a lack of alignment makes us all crazy, but too much of alignment isn't feasible. And I feel like part of doing the research is to like the experience that you have in doing the research keeps telling you what the problem is. And you can come out of research with a clarified design business question. So it's a relationship between three things. It is not clean and not, not uh, chronological, but you need to sort of 
understand and own the dynamic between them and, and facilitate that conversation among peers. So when someone says, you know, what we should do is run a diary study uh, with 17 remote people and then get uh, user testing to do this and this and this. We have to say, well, what do we want to learn out of that? And what are we going to do out of that? Okay? Uh, there's a thing that people like to look for in research that I want to sort of scold you away from. Uh, pain points. You know, and, and it's this, this idea that, let's, the, that our job as people that make things for other people is, let's figure out what their pain points are and then go solve them. Right? Is that a term that people kind of encounter? It's, and it's not that there aren't pain points that we can you know, have business success or make life better or whatever we're looking for by solving them, but that, that is a sort of a, it's kind of a short-sighted view of things, I think. Um, and uh, so here's kind of a silly example, but imagine we went and did some field work and what we saw in, was in people's homes was this picture on the right, was these drawers overflowing with obsolete tech. Right, and do you ever want, yeah, y'all have drawers like this in your house somewhere? And so you could hear, hear that story and say, wow, their drawers are overflowing with obsolete tech. The solution is to give them bigger drawers, more storage space. Right, and so that's a, it's a dumb example, and I appreciate that pasta makes no one laugh because you're like <laughs> just trying to like stay alive here. Um, or you're just waiting for something that's actually funny. So thank you, well that's good, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna work for it. I can work for your love. Um, you know, you can miss the point. If you, if you think about pain points, you can sort of miss what's the, what is the larger unmet need here. Um, and so I got to pick a silly example to kind of illustrate that. Um, right, uh, the paint example, if you've ever tried to open a can of paint and pour it, you, um, well, me anyway, it's a nightmare. The fact that this product is sold with aftermarket openers and aftermarket spouts you know, you can sort of try to fix the pain point, but there's a systems issue, there's a distribution challenge, there's something else going on there. And uh, like there was a lovely design solution to this that I don't see on the stores anymore. So you have to understand these larger problems. And if you take a pain point lens, then you're like, you're, you're not really solving real problems and you can't get the adoption and you can't get the change in the world that you want. So I feel like yes and the pain points. Yes and what's behind that? Let's, let's keep looking for that. And pain points, we see pain points in a way that may not be true for the people that are experiencing them. Um, this one on the bottom left is an actual field work picture. Uh, as you can tell, it's a little while ago, but just kind of the era of the technology. And we were interviewing this woman who was, um, we we're studying printing and how people were using ink, which also tells you sort of the era this was in. And when we went to meet her, she had uh, like a, like a, I don't know, a seven month old baby. And the whole interview ended up being about uh, her husband who had left her after cheating on her. And he like burst into the interview. Uh, he was not living there, but he came in in his fatigues. And he was a uh, athletically uh, potent individual who just said, what the hell are you guys doing in my living room? Um, which was an interesting kind of, the whole experience was interesting. Anyway, here's her home office. She's trying to be a realtor and take care of her kid. Uh, and I don't know if you can tell in this, from this photo, but that fax machine is sort of held in place on top of the monitor by the tension in the telephone cable to the wall. And to me, that's a great example of a satisfied, something that is good enough. Um, we know what the solution to that is, right? It's $1.79 a target. It's a cable with two inches, you know, two feet longer. Um, but, and so you can look at that and go, geez, look at that suboptimal home workspace. Like, we can solve a lot of things for people if we can fix this. She's never going to fix that, right? The pain of, uh, you know, look at what her priorities are and what's going on in her life and think about the balancing act between when the pain of solving the, 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 solving the problem is greater than the pain of the, not solving it, right? That's the equation, basically. So like, this is a big challenge for all of us, and, and it's a huge design challenge, right? You, you can make things better for people, and they don't go take them. If you kind of use a pain point lens at people, you're going to find all kinds of things that people aren't going to do. Uh, and so we, that's why you have to go deeper and kind of understand what's, what lies beneath that. Uh, this example on the right is, is sort of, um, you know, I think there's sort of a fetish for like what I call LOL users, like pictures of people doing stupid stuff. And I like to think about, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's curtains being held 
open or held closed, I guess, by like a big spike in the wall on this, this, uh, this website, there I fixed it. And what I like to do with that picture, and it's just a, it's a, it's a thought exercise, is you know, in what circumstances is that actually a good solution? Like, rather than looking at users and saying how they're not doing the right thing and how they're suffering and everything sucks, like, you know, try to reframe and understand their model. Like, they're doing what works for them based on what they have. So if you understand that, you understand kind of, you know, how to, how to work with them and how to make things different for them. Um, this, I don't know if people remember this Microsoft campaign that showed, uh, that showed users uh, making feature requests. So this is another sort of framing the problem for research thing that I really don't like, that let's go ask users what they want and then they'll tell us, and then we'll make it. If you've ever gone down that road, once you talk to the second customer, your business is just going to burn to the ground, right? Um, and, and so I realized this was an ad, and Microsoft has a lot of people doing this kind of work that we're talking about, and whatever we think of the results, they certainly have made, you know, over the years, a, a reasonable commitment to this. But their advertising people sort of put forth this idea that, oh, we're user-centered. Like, oh, you know, I wish... I wish the memory footprint for your OS was lower. Good suggestion. Guys, gals, everybody get on that. Like that's not how product happens and that's not how innovation happens. And um, you know, I think there's something very seductive about these sort of narratives that we create about learning from users. So this is all around like how do we even think about what problem, what question, why are we going to go do this? I think it goes without saying that you can put different methods together. Um, yeah, which is not a very interesting story. Let's skip that here. Um, it's a really interesting story, and you're going to regret not hearing it. That's how I should be pitching it. But moving on, um, who are we going to learn from? Like, who do we target for research? Who are our participants? And I think sort of standard thinking is you go talk to the people that are going to buy or use your thing. But, you know, we are going to talk to a small number of people, and we're going to learn something from them in order to understand our problem space, the use case, whatever it is. So think about who you learn from not being the same as who you design for. Uh, and one thing you can do with a sample is create contrast. And I, this happens to me all the time. You talk to a bunch of people that tell you things, and then you talk to somebody else that comes from a different perspective, and it's what they don't say that makes you realize, oh, everyone in that first group, the dominant group, said that, and we didn't really note it. It's that cliche that says whoever discovered water it wasn't fish, right? If you're in something, if you're hearing something in your research, it's not, it, it may be the absence of something or maybe just the constant presence of something. When you get a contrast, you, the researcher, have that chance to go, oh, I'd assumed this, but now that I've heard a contrasting example. So you want to, partly what you want to do with your sample is set yourself up to get, you know, multiple perspectives so you can triangulate across that. There are many types of users in any situation. Again, the people that are going to, you know, and we hear phrases like chooser versus user. Uh, you can think about, you know, who are all the users uh, that are affected by like a point of sale system in a restaurant. Not everyone is going to be touching that system, but it's going to impact a lot of them. Anybody that works in enterprise um, and probably many other contexts is very familiar with this. So you can think about that, under, trying to understand the system as part of your, your approach to sampling. Um, the Tom Cruise example was a, was a story with a global uh, apparel manufacturer that told us, we're trying to plan this study, and uh, it took, I think, a month to agree on, it was originally going to be a two-week study, took, which is crazy, it took us a month just to agree on who could be in the study, like what was, what was the idea, and it, it had to do with a lot of like just twisted corporate culture around, uh, and they would say this in one sentence. Uh, this was a web product that was for, you know, sporting apparel. Our target customer is a high school uh, lettered athlete who's going to go to college on a, uh, on, a, on a sports scholarship, and our website is visited predominantly by women between 24 and 35. <laughs> and, you know, you sort of try to probe on that, and they would just sort of repeat that, that truism, and their whole culture was around those two things being true at the same time. So if you were to propose focusing on one or the other of those, it just, it just broke everybody. Um, and so it's just, I don't have like, and then we did X and fixed it. I mean, it was a broken situation. The point here is this discussion about who's going to be in our study is, it can be fraught, uh, but it's really important because it ladders up to all these other kinds of things. 
Uh, and so often I get the, um, the aspirational customer. We want to talk to people that are doing this and this and this and this and this. Like, those people may not exist, and they may be really hard to find. So you have to sort of step back and think more about how are we going to learn, not who manifests our unrealized business goals for kind of a customer base. So we haven't even started doing any research, and we're really, but we're just changing how we're even thinking about the problem. There's a document uh, that you need to prepare, which is captures your questions, an interview guide, a field guide. I think the most important thing here is that it takes questions you want answers to and transforms them into questions you will ask. Does that make sense? And then th those are not the same thing. So that's sort of the art of, of doing this, is to figure out how do you want to talk about it. It may take 20 questions. You're never going to actually ask the questions the way you do write this guide, but writing this guide is a really key activity to getting yourself in the head of what's going to happen when you go in the field. It's this great document that you can share with everyone, and they can say, oh, we're not talking about this. Let's make sure we cover this. Not, not to sort of copy edit your guide, but to see sort of how complete it is. And it's sort of a previs of the interview that you can distribute and get buy-in on. If you're working in parallel, multiple interviewers, you want to have everyone start with the same document as sort of the initial, the initial point. Um, you know, I often see people uh, writing little how-tos about research. I think I may even have done this myself on this deck. And they say, never ask the question, blah, 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 blah. And I, I think usually what they mean is, Never assume that if you ask this question, the answer you get will be the answer to that question. Right? Never ask how much it costs. Never ask this. You can ask whatever you want. Tell them Steve Portugal said you can ask whatever you want, <laughs> which is like the most arrogant thing I've ever said. Um, uh, you can ask whatever you want. You have to understand the context in which it's going to be received and what to do with that answer. If you, someone, you've asked them, what should, what should this product cost? and you collect a bunch of answers, don't go price your product based on that. But it might reveal something else. And so that's what you're kind of looking for. And so that, that act of figuring out how to ask those questions in order to get the information you want is really a huge amount of skill. And it's a planning. And we're still not in the field yet. We're talking about planning. You've still got to really think about how to do that. Um, I'm going to skip some of these things. This is available. Uh, well, this deck is online, um, or a version of it on SlideShare. And um, yeah, these things are available elsewhere. Um, I'll point you at the end to the resources page in Rosenfeld Media. This document is up there uh, on the book page in Rosenfeld Media. So you can get these documents and other ones to kind of pull up like a four or five page interview guide if you want to get an example. Um, and, and I say interview, but again, we're talking about a lot of other things that you might do while you're with someone. So ask them to do a task, to draw something for you. Um, to engage you in an activity, to show you how to do something, to um, show you how they do something. Those are different, right? Show me how I should do this versus show me how you do it. One is getting the person to teach. The other is getting the person to explain. I don't have a magic formula that says, always use one or the other. This is about sort of having a large palette. Um, yeah, make note of the things you want to make sure to go look at. You know, what are these, uh, what file folders do they have open? What other tools? What plugins have they configured, whatever that is, make sure you make note of things you want to be sure to see, because you'll forget. That's what this plan is about. Um, you can do things with people that are um, getting them to talk about how they would solve a problem. So participatory design is a, is, a, is a label often used for that. And often there's a concern, well, I don't want customers to tell me what the thing should be. But again, you can ask any question. So ask them what the thing should be. You interpret that. It's you know, uh, solutions that I envision and needs that I have are proxies for each other. So talking to them about what, um, what they might see as a solution is a way to get through something that maybe is harder to, to articulate. What do you want to have your product do? Well, I don't know. Well, let's draw it. So, so you, know, you want to come at this problem in as many different ways as possible. So when someone says, uh, you know, someone, someone puts a handle on it, uh, you know, you have to say, well, they're trying to make the product portable. So we can put it in the cloud. We can uh, change its form factor or aspect ratio. We can make it modular. So the designers of all stripes solve the need in different ways, not the literal way that the person 
had, had asked for. I think both, yeah. So the question was, can you, would you ask someone, well, why did you put a handle on it? Um, you know, you can't ask that about everything. Um, but yeah, you know, you can talk to them about their needs or you can take that away and, and infer. Both are good. Uh, showing somebody a solution. So this is more about exploring than testing. Uh, and there's, what a lot, of, a lot of times happens is people take the artifact of their design process and put it in front of people. Let's see how we're doing. As opposed to saying, what artifacts could we create that could help us explore our topics? And including uh, creating artifacts that could not possibly exist, like the tiniest um, flip phone imaginable. This is not buildable, it's not usable, but you start putting these different form factors in front of people and you get to have a different conversation. So you can create sort of more, um, more extreme versions of, of experiences that, that highlight or, or celebrate different aspects in order to drive a conversation about something you're interested in understanding. I mean, I think we know what mock-ups are. My favorite thing about this study was um, there was a Greek text on the back of this newsletter. We were talking about a newsletter that was going to come with your, your credit card bill. And uh, there was uh, like you know, the whole lorem ipsum Greek text was on the back of it. And this woman uh, flipped it over and said, oh, this is great. You include another language. And you know, I, I'm not, I don't laugh at her, I sort of laugh at us, like how, again, you're exposing your processes to someone. Don't, you need to create artifacts to be tested, not show comps to somebody that doesn't, that's not a designer. It sort of, it reveals our own arrogance. Um, right here's a physical mock-up that was, uh, yeah, this was a, a, a DVD projector that was just not, the, the box wasn't designed, it was off the shelf box. In fact, the person I was working with checked that prototype in the, uh, uh, into the luggage and then, gee, the audio didn't work when we took it out to go in the field. And so we're, in the, we're sitting in a cafe while he's like trying to take it apart. He never could fix it. So we ended up having this sort of silent film experience with people and we asked them to describe the qualities of the audio that would go through with the video. So <laughs> it wasn't ideal, but I think it was a reasonable workaround. I didn't feel like the interviews were bad because of it, but it's kind of funny. Um, you can do things with people before and after and during, right? You can have them do stuff beforehand. Save up things before we go, before we go to see you. Um, you can give them sort of assignments, um, you know, fill out log books. You can bring things to show them. You can do these exercises, show me what's in your wallet, show me what's in your fridge, show me what's, uh, you know, what's on the third screen of your, uh, of your uh, mobile device, whatever it is. I think there's a, there's a lot of creativity and inventiveness to go into these kinds of things. Um, and you know, I make up stuff. Uh, because I wrote a book, I had to give this a name. Uh, I called it Casual Card Sort, but really it's just uh, a bunch of prompts, including some blank ones. And you sit down with someone and you have them start grouping it and then talking about it. Um, this was about, I think, reviewing things online. And so we have this artifact in front of us and we can have a different conversation than if I'm just sitting staring at someone and saying, well, what about Yelp? What about iTunes? Like, we could move these things around and it started to get a little a little tangible. So you can sort of always go out with stickies in a pen and maybe uh, a model or a grouping kind of emerges. Not, this is a, like super, super casual and lightweight. Um, it wasn't a designed method. We're like, well, let's just print these things out and use them to have the conversation. Um, another thing to kind of look for in the field. So we're starting to, we're starting to get close to being in the field. Um, this is an ad, so here's an ad. Three really large dudes in football jerseys eating the world's largest hoagie sandwich. And the, uh, sl the tagline says, bring it on. What is this an advertisement for? What did you say? And acid. That's, very, that's the closest we're going to get, I think. But that's good. Who else? Now that I said that, no one else is going to guess. Uh, usually you hear like Subway or... Um, NFL, antacid. It's an ad for a low flow toilet. <laughs> right, and so that reaction, ugh, that reaction is sort of advertising's job, right? Advertising identifies where, where normal is and then it just steps over it and that's kind of like made you look, right? Advertising is violating our norms, not enough that they get taken off the air, but just enough that you know them. So 
you can look for these cues all over the place. Um, you know, you look them in physical environments, you see them online. There's a lot of discussion uh, that we kind of process as human beings around what's acceptable, what's normal. And these are also things you need to understand. When you want to change behavior uh, of all types, you need to understand what are the rules that are kind of keeping that behavior in place and what might you be violating. Um, and just think about the adoption cycle culturally, forget the market penetration of things like Bluetooth headsets. And, you know, or even just people walking around sort of hands-free and do you remember, oh, that person's talking to themselves, we would kind of say as kind of a joke. And, and those products were pushing against normalcy and they had to kind of overcome that. And over time, I think the, the benefits outweighed the risks or more, enough people started to do it that it started to become normal. You're that first person, then, uh, then you now have, so, so again, these are just issues to consider uh, and to look for in the field. You may not get this in your interview, but you might get it um, you know, out in the culture that your interview takes place. So just back to tactics, photos, I mean, digital photos, they're just, you can take so many um, and, and, and see things later that you won't see in the moment. As long as you have permission, um, they're great sharing artifacts. There's a sample worksheet in the resources page like this that just, it's a shot list that kind of helps you remember what to capture so that you have a way to tell the story about that interview afterwards. This is one that comes up a lot. Um, people like to take notes in the field and they think that if you just take good notes, you have the interview. You do not. You have to get an audio or a video recording. Yeah, people that know are nodding along, thank you. People speak way too fast. Like a court reporter maybe could do this, but you cannot do it. You need the full fidelity of what they said and how they said it. Your notes are incredibly distorted and edited. And there's value to that, but if you don't have the actual thing, then I think you're kind of, you're kind of wasting your time. Um, so yeah, make the recording. Yes? So when you record, one thing that I'm always worried about is um, they're not going to say the truth because I know they're being recorded. So how do you get around that? Uh, if people are not going to say the truth, there's a lot of things that, you know, there's somebody in their office asking to see what their uh, appointment calendar looks like. I mean, these are not normal things that are happening. Um, so we're going to talk about rapport in a minute, and I think the rapport is the thing that you do that helps the interview be successful. All right, so let's talk about field work. Um, you know, there's a great relationship between principles and tactics, so I'm going to talk at a principle level, but it all feel, feeds tactics. Uh, you know, Gretzky's father actually was the one that, that, that said that uh, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where it's going to be. No one talked about Gretzky, sorry, it's a Canadian thing here, but no one talked about Gretzky and like his stick handling or what kind of skates, how he laced up his skates or what his gait was. They talked about this. This sort of captured what made him the greatest uh, so effectively. Um, and so I think it's good to have principles and, you know, again, I'll try to connect them to some tactics for you as well. But I have four field work principles for you. The first is to check your worldview at the door. The second is to embrace how other people are seeing the world. The third is to build rapport. And the fourth is to listen. And I'll, I'll talk about each of those in turn. So checking your worldview, that means like what do you think is going on with those people? You have to set that aside. And it's one thing to say, well, just set it aside. But I want to give you some, a couple of tactics. One is a uh, sort of team-wide thing that you can do before a project starts. Just talk about what you think you're going to see. Now, I don't mean make a list, make sure everyone agrees, don't have anything contradictory, and then go back and see if you're right. I mean it's almost like an, an act of you know, expulsion. Get it out of your heads. Once you say it out loud, including someone saying, like, I think they're going to be super engaged by our new release, and I don't think they're going to be super engaged by our new release, the act of people in the team saying that and writing it down is what you want to do. Now you are prepared to hear something new because you're not sort of clenching on to that. That's not an assumption anymore. Um, and then the other sort of on an interview basis itself. And so you're going to go do some session with somebody, clear everything else out. And you can even turn to someone that you're with and say like, okay, our next hour is about learning about Paul, not about you know, prioritizing feature lists for the, the roadmap. Just make it about being learning about Paul. 
Um, and I have the, uh, the meditation uh, bells here from a client of mine that used to bring these out in the field. And she would kind of, they get out of the car and her and her colleagues, and she would do that. Anyone that does yoga or does meditation sort of could explain these better than I, I could. It's sort of about centering, kind of creating a moment that just, just pulls you in. And this was, this was not even someone from, from, uh, from our part of California, from another part of California where, you know, we wouldn't maybe blink at this idea. But uh, that was pretty radical and someone in a big corporation. Um, and there's, like, that sort of captured the idea, just, just kind of, you know, coming in and being clear and then letting the thing happen that's going to happen. Um, and sort of set, you know, setting yourself up to be able to be successful here. So the first is, you know, take your worldview that you have and set it aside. And then the second is to embrace their view. And I choose the verb embrace really specifically. I don't mean be willing to hear it or accept it. I mean embrace it. That's like, and you know what embrace is, it's kind of like go out, you know, put your arms around it, grab it, and pull it back in. You have to be really hungry and kind of grabby for what their view of the world is. So if you go to where they are, that's a hell of a way to start manifesting that. Um, and then just some, ta some tactical things. You make sure you don't have to go to the bathroom, that you're not hungry. You know, these are important. It's very hard to be present with somebody when you just keep pulling yourself back into your, into your body. Leave time. Don't be rushing out to the airport after an interview. You know, you have to give yourself the chance. Be fair to yourself so you can take advantage of this experience. Uh, and here's a tactical thing that I think is hard. Uh, it's, very, it's very hard. Ask questions that you think you know the answer to. And do it in an authentic way. And sometimes people are like, well, and what, what would you click on? To? You can sort of hear them trying to sort of ask it. They know the answer. Like, just be able to, you have to find it within yourself to be able to say, like, well, when, when are taxes due? You know, and not say, like, well, I know when taxes are due, so I shouldn't ask that question. They'll think I'm dumb. Just ask the question and be, you're asking about their experience. So the more you kind of are willing to embrace them, the more you can ask questions. Because every time you don't ask a question because you assume what the answer is, you're kind of you're t not taking advantage of the whole, all the effort you've done to go do this interview. OK, rapport. I mean, rapport is this thing. It's this engine that makes the interview good. People start telling you stuff. Um, and some people are just very affable, and you can connect with them easily. Others take more time. Um, so there's some things that you can do, and sometimes they're counterintuitive. Um, social graces is one. Sometimes you go in and you start chatting. And like chatting too much, I think, is, can be weird. Like, you've asked for my time, what's happening? Um, not chatting enough is sort of robotic. So I don't have a magic answer for you, but sort of be sensitive to those, to those endpoints of, of how to kind of move things along. Um, accept what you're offered is really interesting. When you go to see someone in a workplace, they're having a meeting. If you go to see someone in their home, they're having a guest. You're doing research, but that's not the script that they're following. So work with their script. If you come into someone's house and they say, would you like a glass of water? Like my colleagues and I used to think like, oh, we don't want to like Im impact them negatively. We don't want to be pains. Um, and we, we interviewed this woman who just would not would not talk to us. She was just very clipped and very uncomfortable. And after about half an hour, she says to us again, would you like something to drink? And then something just kind of went off. And we said, yes. She went and got the glasses of water with the ice and kind of brought them out. And we all had our glasses of water. And then we had a really nice conversation. We were, ta we were not putting her at ease because we refused her offer. It was a very simple kind of thing. And, and then we realized, OK, you know, you know, I, we went and visited someone a few months ago, and they had a whole, uh, they just got an espresso machine. We got a whole ritual with an espresso machine and the foam attachment and the whole thing. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to get the camera set up and do all this stuff. It turned out two hours later at the end of the interview that that Nespresso machine was the core to unlocking and a whole, this woman's entire worldview. Um, <laughs> it was really, really, really interesting. And I thought, oh, it's a good thing that we, it sort of indulged her. She wanted to show us and play and do this and kind of like, you know. But um, it was important to kind of let her set the stage for us. We were coming into her home. Uh, another tactic here, these are you know, all rapport tactics. Um, you know, talking about yourself. If you have someone tells you something about themselves, like, you know, I can't stand I Fear the Walking Dead. It's nowhere near as good as uh, The Walking Dead. And you're like, 
oh my God, I know, what is going on? You, know, don't, you don't have to say that. You can have that reaction. Like, you feeling a connection with them is great. You saying it may be superfluous. It's about them. Um, so you know, I had this experience uh, a couple of years ago where uh, we were talking to this woman. She just she talked and talked and talked and talked. She was someone that ran um, a nonprofit that kind of helped uh, people, the young people in the criminal justice system, um, and uh, she basically does sort of case management. Then my wife works. Uh, she's a case manager. She works with. Uh, uh, psychiatric patients have been hospitalized. And so I start seeing the parallels. You know, at, at the beginning of the interview, I sort of thought I, I, I could say, like, oh, my wife died. I didn't do it. And in fact, she spoke kind of un, uh, without any prompting for a really long time. But then at one point, she starts describing um, basically the dark humor that gets shared in those environments. And she kind of catches herself, because she's basically saying, like, she's this incredibly caring person. She says, you know, she basically says they make jokes about people in the system. Um, and she realizes now she's presented herself in a way she doesn't know how to kind of manage that. And I said to her, yeah, my wife does the same kind of work and I know exactly those kind of jokes that you're talking about. That's when I shared about myself. I gave her kind of the, the permission. So revealing about yourself as a way to help them, not because you're eager and you think like, yeah, me too, me too. You don't have to do that to connect with them. You focusing on them is like the greatest gift you will ever give anybody he said hyperbolically, but it's really, it, it just, people love it when you pay attention to them. And so the rapport is about them, not about you giving of yourself. And that's a little counterintuitive. Um, there's this tipping point that happens in this, this little squiggly diagram is kind of shows what happens when you go question, answer, question, answer, question, story. It, it feels like to me, there's almost a magic moment at which people start telling you stories. And you don't know when that's gonna be, uh, I don't have a, like a trick for you except to just to think about that and be aware that that's a model. That, and sometimes when you're in the story mode, just go like, oh yeah, this is where we're getting stories. Um, and that's, you know, that's how you know that the rapport is kind of is paying off. So listening, and I think you know, in some ways this is all about listening. Um, um, and this is counterintuitive. You show that you are listening by asking questions. Right? I'm listening to you, I'm gonna say something. Uh, you know, uh, follow-up questions. People respond well to that. Uh, throwing in the cues. Uh, you know, earlier you mentioned something else. I want to go back to that. Um, you know, that tells somebody that you heard what they said, you thought it was important, you remembered, you want to know more about it. That's this thing that you're giving them. That's the listening. Um, if you, you know, these, I always imagine like the platonic ideal of an interview is like one question and then the whole thing is just follow-up. But Inevitably, you need to change topics. So just tell them, kind of tell them what you're doing. Okay, I'm thinking about our time here. I'm gonna to switch to a totally different topic now. That's great, that tells them. Then you don't get that sort of Barbara Walters thing. You know, you guys know these interviews where they, the, the questions are just dissonant. You know, uh, if you were a world leader, you know, who would you want to have met? What kind of tree do you think is the most beautiful? Like that is not listening, right? And so you wanna tell people that you're listening by helping them follow the path that you're on. Um, this is not what we do when we talk to each other. We're not trained interpersonally to do this. You have to sort of unlearn a lot of things to do this, to let them talk the most, to make it about them, to follow up with them. Um, and it's, it's hard. It is really, really, really hard. And it sounds sort of simplistic, but I, which one, I want everyone to understand this is like, this is an effort to, to unlearn. There's body language for listening. Um, you know, you can, so think about not only what is the cue given to the list to the interviewee from this interviewer's body language, but also what, um, what are they telling themselves? And there's more and more research about how uh, we can induce emotion with our physical posture. So sit like you're listening will make it easier for you to listen. Here is the, here's the slide with the trick. Uh, that will turn a bad interviewer into a mediocre interviewer and a mediocre interviewer into a good interviewer. There's a couple of tricks in here. Um, it's about silence. It's about what you don't say. So this is what happens a lot. Uh, you're interested in somebody's breakfast. You say, um, what did you have for breakfast today? Did you have toast or juice or cereal or... And that, there is that little er. You, can, you, you, you kind of trail off er. People kind of trail <laughs> off the question. Uh, the question to ask is, what did you have for breakfast today? 
So there's a couple of things that I did in that example, the bad, the bad, the before, is I started putting sample answers in the question. Um, and, and, and that comes from a good place, but it's a bad thing. Like, I want to help you come up with a possible answer. So I'm going to suggest what possible breakfast items might be to kind of give you an example of what I'm looking for. Right? And, and even if it's a complicated thing, you start suggesting, that starts to, to tell the person, oh, I know how to do a good job for Steve. It's to respond within the framework that he's presented me. And so you do that over the course of an interview. By the end of the interview, that person is playing to you. I just, they can't help it. So you have to have the discipline to ask the qu simple question. And so the other element here is the reason that I think we do this is because of fear. And I don't mean like fear of, fear of werewolves kind of fear. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a discomfort. It's, just, it's, a, it's a liminal kind of experience where when we stop saying the question, we're in trouble because we don't know what's going to happen. So we ask as long a question as possible and include some examples and then even include some verbal ellipsis where we go, er, to hold that moment where we stop talking off into the future as long as possible because, oh my God, what's going to happen when? Right, so the, it's to kind of face that fear, and, I'm, and, and fear kind of is a little bit of a dramatic term for it, but that hesitation that you have, and, and just, you know, sometimes I'll just say to myself, like, you know, let there be silence. Like, I'll just turn it inwards and give myself a little strength just to say, what did you have for breakfast today? And like, <laughs> like just stop right there and, 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 and force myself to do it. This is, this is an, again, a lot of these things are really hard because it's not how we talk, and it's not how we talk when we're put in these situations. But these, these are a couple little things that will just make all the difference. The corollary, of course, is that people speak in paragraphs. And so, what did you have for breakfast today? Uh, you know, I had some juice, and then I had leftover pizza, and uh, I was hoping to have some, uh, some of this uh, buca carbonaro, but uh, it was all gone, so I didn't get to bring any home. And you just kind of like, and the thing about carbonara is, is like, it's the best breakfast food, and no one ever tells you that. Like, there's, there, there's a pause, and then the next paragraph starts. You don't need to like, wait for your next question. Just give it some space. Let, that, let, let the answer kind of play out. And the pause is not your cue to answer the next question. It is when we're talking, right? Because they're like, oh, oh, I have something else to say. But in, in the interview, you can just do nothing. So there's kind of two do nothings, like ask, a, ask less of a question, say nothing at the end of your question, say nothing at the end of the answer. Like that, and the world starts to become your oyster. I don't want to oversimplify it, but that really, it really opens things up. Um, quick story here. Uh, I was doing some field work, and uh, we were talking to this guy who had set up this whole home entertainment system for his family, and he was really quite proud of his home and his family and this tech and what it enabled them and how their lives were, what their lives were like. And he kept describing this digital video recorder that he chose not to get called Tyvo. And my client was with me. I imagined that it made him wince every time. I, it was like a, a former engineer, um, very, very sweet man, but I'm sure he was wincing. Like, that's not what you say. Um, Later on in the interview, I asked a question. I referred back to the story, and I think you know what I did. I asked him about Tyvo. Right? That's what he said. So I, I did that, um, and he answered the question. Later on, my client asked him a question, and he says, Tivo. My client was not trying to correct him. Right? When, I think when he saved the utterance to short-term memory, I know the brain is not a computer, but just think about it this way. He didn't save the original version. He translated, and he just said, like, oh, yeah, it doesn't like to use TiVo. He didn't capture the metadata, uh, you know, which is how the person talked. So, again, this guy was in front of his family, very, very proud. These people from California and the West Coast come into his house and start talking about, now all of a sudden he doesn't know what he's talking about. And you just could feel the room kind of go like, Ooh. It was a really, really small thing and had a really, really big impact. And fortunately, I was kind of able to restore it because he and I had something and sort of, you know, how these two were, it was less important. So I kind of stuck with him. But that's really sort of dangerous to the rapport of your interview. Um, fixing things, uh, whether it's, especially when it's our products and you see someone tell you, um, you know, I wish there was like, a, like a, a help feature where you could kind of get a video about how to use this. Or, um, 
yeah, there's no way to configure that uh, uh, so that uh, so that I can I can link it back to Outlook now. Um, the, the, this is the worst mistake that you can make. You start fixing it for them, the interview is over, and you cannot come back from this one. It's now the world's most expensive tech support call. Um, <laughs> You know, if they speak something that's inaccurate or untrue, just let it, let it be. Let it go. Listen to it. Collect that. It's good information. At the end of the interview, when you're done, if you think it would be helpful to them, now I don't mean tell them, send them off to your lab's product site so they can try this and do that. It's not about you pitching things you want to see adopted or that you worked on. If they have a problem and you think you can help them, of course tell them. I helped a guy move his Windows monitors left and right because it was just, you know, he, you know, where you'd cursor over to one side and it would come out the other way. You know, I, it wasn't my product, but I, he was complaining about it. And when we we're done, I'm like, did you want me to fix that? I have that problem myself. So I still kept it. I didn't, like, tower over him. I just said, like, I had this. I have fixed it myself. Do you want me to do that? And I handed him, like, his incentive check. And he says, this thing was even better. This was the more important. So the interview is over, but it was a nice way to kind of pay back the thing that he'd done for me. Well, so there's there's two things. One is um, one is when we ha so how do you get out of these things? So there's two things that happen. One is the person speaks a, an upsetting untruth. Um, there's no way to do this and this with this product, and they may or may not know who you're from or whatever. Uh, so first thing to do is sit on your hands, right? Just let it go. The second thing is when the person starts turning it around, right, and says, um, is there going to be a way or is there a way? So that's sort of, that's the slippery slope. And if you start taking the questions, then, you're, then, it, then it's definitely over uh, as well. Um, so there's kind of a couple ways. The, the layered thing, I guess, is the, um, you know, the market research or the user research answer is, would you want it to have that? Um, so you can just flip it back at them, right? You know, uh, is there going to be a way in a future releases to have that? You could say, is that going to be there? Uh, what, what would you want it to have? Why would you want that to be there? The trick is, that, is even to say what I just said. Well, you know, there's a whole user research question. You can, like, point to the question as a way to respond and sort of call attention to the moment as a little bit of a safety valve. All right. Um, I'm getting the... the, the, her, the the hook is coming soon. Um, yeah, so one thing that happens is you ask the person a question, they give you an answer. That answer prompts three other questions. And then for good listening, a good rapport, you just say, mm-hmm. And then they give you another answer. And then you have, a, now you have seven questions you want to answer just from what they've said, let alone what's on your interview guide. So you have to have some way of, of managing this. You can't ask every question. Uh, as they start to come to you. So one thing is, <coughs> just wait. Some of these things come up organically. Um, you can sort of make quick notes. And I don't mean notes to capture what they said. I mean notes to get it off of your mental you know, uh, monkey mind so you don't get preoccupied by it. Um, uh, you can think about what's most pressing for your topic. You have seven questions. What, what do we need to get to? And this is, again, that's not a there's no magic answer for that. Um, but I think my favorite is to triage on the relationship with the person. Uh, and so I, had, I was doing this, I was coaching some people doing field work. We were doing these interview sessions. And this guy that I was coaching was so personal. Just, you just like wanted to hang with him the second that you met him. He was so connected and such a good listener. And um, uh, this person we were talking to was describing a whole financial process they were going through. And they said, uh, and they told this long story, and it culminated with, um, you know, I put all this stuff together, and I hand it to my CPA, and then I go home and I have a panic attack. And my guy says, uh, what kind of folder did you bring it in? And I, and I just thought, no, right? Like, when someone says to you, like, they reveal something like that, that's kind of a trust fall, right? They're saying, like, I'm going to reveal something vulnerable about myself. Can I trust you to take good care of that? That cue, like you kind of almost always have to go there. You have to talk about that. Um, like also, like why? Like why was he having a panic attack about this? We, we sort of need to know that for the information. And afterwards he said that he was just a little uncomfortable with it. He didn't really know how to step in there. So he was great when everything was great, but when things got a little weird, 
he, he backed out, but he really needed to step all the way into that. Um, and so that, that can be scary for us, because now we're having a conversation we weren't sure we were going to have. But, you know, like we were talking about printers, and now we're learning about cheating uh, military husbands, right? So the stuff that we talk about connects with everything that's going on in people's lives, and you have to, you know, that's part of the, the, the trust dance you're doing with them. And this can be kind of crazy and overwhelming, um, but what also happens is a flow state. And again, I don't know how to guarantee you receive the flow state. I don't know. It just happens for me sometimes. And I'll just throw it out there so when it happens to you, if ever it does, you sort of recognize it. It's this moment where things are going really, really fast, and you have 20 questions you want to ask now, and you're thinking about this and that and watching the clock. And then suddenly it's like you find another gear in between two gears, and you can kind of just slow down, and you have all the time in the world, like where that, the, the pressure and the energy of trying to control you know, these exploding questions starts to free things up. And um, yeah, this doesn't happen to me very often, but it's really interesting when it does. It's, it, the, the, the speed produces kind of, uh, the speed and pressure produces these kinds of interesting, interesting uh, states. One way to learn is to uh, share war stories. Um, this is the book that I'm working on now is about things that happen to people. There's a URL there. Uh, you can read Dan Salzberg's story about kneeling in cat pee and uh, how he handled it. There's many, 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 many stories. It's a really interesting area. So I'm just going to quickly, uh, this is like you know a four hour talk that I'm going to give you a couple of slides on, doing something with the data. Um, so think about analysis is taking something and, uh, and breaking it into smaller pieces, and synthesis is combining smaller pieces into something new. And really, this is an analysis and synthesis process. And you sort of start with one and you end with the other, but they're kind of happening simultaneously. I've been advocating for the last few years that we combine them into one process. This name is not being like taken up. Um, hashtag, you know, something that so whatever. Help me out with this. There's a reason for it. OK. Well, I'm going to take feedback afterwards. I don't know. I think it's an important term. So this goes back to what I was saying about note taking versus recording. There's two levels of data that come from field research or any kind of research process. One is the experience that you have. You've taken notes. You've been talking to people in the hallway. You filled out debrief worksheets afterwards. That's really important data in your head. Uh, and so what I like to do is it's, 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 it's to work iteratively through the data. And the first pass is to capture what do we think that we heard? What are we starting to see? You know, to me, this is a, is a top line summary of what are the areas in which we have insight. And share that and talk about it and see what we're missing or see what other people heard or see what's starting to challenge closely held beliefs. Then go back to the data and, you know, a more rigorous I mean, for me, this is going through and kind of reading everything and making notes. And again, this is a, it's, a whole, it's a whole thing we're not going to get into. But I want to just give you that model that, that the data in your head is a first pass. As a, I don't, so I don't want to say the data in your head is irrelevant. It's really relevant. And going through that helps you then be prepared for that more deeper dive into the data, the body of data itself. There's a lot of different kinds of things that you can output. Um, and so I'll just offer this one uh, as, as, as was a possibility. It's, it's creating how might we questions. And maybe lots of people are familiar with how might we as it's sort of the, it's the wonderful yet cliched sort of design thinking type thing. And sometimes they're called HMW. If you want to really like sound down, just call them HMWs. Um, but how might we doesn't say how will we, right? And, and so you take these, these things that you've learned then kind of boil them down. And so it's not fix this thing, do this thing. It's how might we make this kind of output or this kind of, this kind of outcome happen in the world for people. And then you know, answers to that, of course, can, are, are what we then have to generate and then prioritize and filter and, and, and set up. So yeah, and then the last, I guess the last thing here is, um, but we don't have time to do this. So, Here's kind of one version of a, of a time frame. It takes a couple, two to three weeks to figure out what's the problem, what are we going to do, who are they going to be, let's find these people, let's be ready to go in the field. It takes a couple weeks to do field work, all depending, and it takes a couple weeks to go through all this data. So 
if you don't have any time, then you have to make trade-offs. It's not like you can uh, not do these things. But think about what the trade-offs are. So I've just tried to articulate that. If you don't have any time to think about who you want to talk to, then it's who can you get. That's going out on the street and grabbing people. It's grabbing coworkers. Um, and not, these may be fine, but they're trade-offs. And so you want to just, when you're planning, think about what those trade-offs are. What do you want to do with them? If you don't really get to develop something, uh, then you're really just like, oh, let's just go see how they do their work. It's just a basic observation activity. Uh, or winging it, which I try to avoid doing. Um, if you only have a day to do field work, then you either have a small sample or you have a lot of people out in the field at once. Then you still got to bring all that back, so it still creates a challenge there. Um, if you only have a couple days to do the data, you're really doing that debrief test as task, that first step that I described. If you want to go back and do the more rigorous deep dive into the data itself, you just, you just need more time. So here's four days versus whatever, like you know, six to nine weeks. Um, and, and again, it's just it's trade-offs. So think about what the trade-offs are and, and what works for you. So three things I've kind of mentioned, I think, throughout here, um, or that Dan mentioned at the beginning. So the book is uh, the Rosenfeld Media site there. Um, and so there's resources there. There's lots of uh, handouts and bits and pieces that, that uh, are what I talked about here. Um, I'm sure this deck or version of it is there. My book about war stories is coming out this year. Um, it's gonna, it's, I'm having a lot of fun writing it, so I hope people will uh, enjoy it. And then um, Dan mentioned my podcast. This is a podcast where I interview people who are uh, in-house leading user research functions, which was a job that didn't exist. There were no leaders in user research, or very few anyway, in recent past. So. Um, it's kind of an emergent category and just really great stories from people. Um, anyone, has anyone heard the podcast? All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, if, you, if, you're in, if you're interested in podcasts, check that out. And that, uh, I think we're at uh, question time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Steve, for a great talk. Let's give him a round of applause here. Really enjoyed your talk, a lot of great advice. So let's go to Q&A. We have <clears throat> two wireless mics that we run around, okay? And um, just raise your hand if you want to get a question, and you may have to wait till the person with the other mic goes first, okay? Thanks. This is good for anticipation, isn't it? Exactly. Like, what kind of question is it going to be? <laughs> this never happens in a Q&A, right? Hold it until it's green is life advice. Exactly. No, it's not working. So it wasn't clear uh, whether uh, you are suggesting to have one-on-one -on -one interviews or was it a group interview? Because most of the uh, use cases you mentioned were one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I mean a group interview is that's not an interview, yes. right? That's that other thing that what is, I think it's the other F word. I think oh, is what people right. call that now. <laughs> Uh, right. I mean, these are in context. So, and there are so many different yeah. kinds of methods, right? There's people that do uh, what they call them living room interviews. So you do a focus group, but you do it in somebody's house, or maybe it's uh, what do they call them? Friendship circles. There's every kind of terminology and variation where you can get people to get their friends together. Um, you know, once you have a group, you're sort of it's like waiting for you to get the mic, right? I mean, it's just it's a lot of dead air. Um, and so you ask a question and everyone, even if it's three people, to kind of go around and answer it. Um, you know, what, talking to a family or talking to people that are in a system, like we work together, we live together, or we solve this task together, I think that's, that, can be, that can be a reason to talk to people. But it seems like groups is an efficiency thing. Like, well, let's get, we can talk to 60 users if we do five groups of eight. Well, I think it's a false economy. And so... Um, you know, I want to learn from that person about their thing, and you can't have a lot of these conversations if there's other people there. So I really I think about the system, but yeah, I guess the short answer is one-on-one. -on -one. Question. 
other than running out of time and money, how do you know when you've done enough interviews? I like that question, yeah. Um, I mean, one answer is uh, you start to hear repeated things. Uh, you know, so you sort of keep interviewing until you hear repetition. Uh, I mean, I don't have, I, to me, we always plan ahead of time what we're going to do. And so that, there's that question, right, that it comes up with every user research method, like, what's the ultimate sample size? And that question has been, like, uh, like intellectually dismantled by many people. I sort of wish I could pull one of them in there and tell you why it's wrong to even, ans at, uh, to even ask that question. But, um, you know, I think with time and, and practice, you sort of start to figure out what a sample, it, like, what makes a unit of a study. Um, when clients say like, oh, we were thinking of doing some large number, and I'll just say 30 to me is a large number. If, if you have 30 in mind, and again, it depends on what's the diversity and what, what, what's different about people or businesses or whatever, um, I'd I start, start to try to put that into phases. Well, let's do something and then see what we've learned and then do something else from that. Even when I get the, we want to do four countries and this and three cities, like, can we find ways to chunk this up so that we are, you know, having these cycles of, of doing research and learning and doing research and learning and, and kind of it all builds. Um, so I tend to go just smaller rather than larger. I don't know if I answered your question or several other questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, you had some... The, the whole avoid bias thing, I mean, it's, the stuff's biased, right? I think there's, and I think that, um, like, trying to approach this in a, I think the whole attempt to avoid bias, and there are different kinds of biases, obviously, but, um, yeah, how do you go about doing that? I mean, I think you start talking about, uh, it's a discussion about, well, what's going to give us the most bang for our buck? What's going to be germane? Uh, sometimes it's hypotheses. Um, so I just, I'm just i just wrapping up a study on small business, people who run small businesses, and we had this really interesting conversation about like, who should be in that study, and it turns out in this organization there are some closely held truths about who they're building for. Um, <coughs> and my gatekeeper client pointed out to me that that's a cultural artifact. It's kind of like the, the apparel, sports apparel people. It's a cultural artifact based on some financial models about where their profit margin would be optimized for their product, as opposed to what are people doing. So we ended up going through this, this narrative. So a small business person uh, for financial products, well, they probably have to, be, they have to be around for this long. They have to have you know, this kind of uh, revenue. And so we know this area, so we know something about that. Excuse me. And then we started talking about, uh, well, they have to have payroll, they have to have a certain amount of complexity. So we're kind of creating a narrative and bouncing some things around and then, well, what about two to five people as employees? Or what about part-time employees? Well, I think anybody that they're paying probably qualifies. So we're kind of working through what, <coughs> what some kinds of characteristics are going to be. And then we started talking about, well, should they be techie? Well, what does techie mean? Are they using these things? Are they using, you know, we started exploring a bunch of other kinds of things and then kind of paired them back. Um, so it's a discussion based on, um, you know, what's in our heads about people. Um, you know, where will we start to get information about what it is we think we want to understand? And so you're sort of translating some of the implicit into some of the explicit. And then, you know, what's that thing about uh, before you leave the house, like take off a couple, you know, put a couple of items back, right? You you come up with your ultimate uh, profile, and then you got to let go of a few things because the more complicated you get it, the more you're never going to find those people. I just had a question. So I work at mark in marketing at a big organization where we have a user experience design group. We've got third parties who we can do for the, this for us. When should we do it ourselves versus have other people go out and do the interviews for us? Yeah, I think, why can't you work with them? I mean, I think I don't ever go do, I don't ever do research, you know, so I work, I'm a, I'm a vendor, right? Um, and I've, that's a red flag for me in a, in a client conversation where they just want me to go 
do that. Yeah. Um, the good thing is few people seem to want that. They seem to be hungry to get people out. So, um, in, so I've partnered with, with client teams in lots of different ways. I've sort of joined their team. Some of them have been sort of seconded to join my team. Sometimes I'm kind of creating a fieldwork experience and we're bringing a lot of people through it. Um, so I might own the planning and through the heavy lifting with the data, but I'm giving, helping get everyone get exposure. Um, you know, I think ideally getting people out is the best, if not kind of involving them in, in, in debrief conversations and so on. So stories about the field are kind of happening. Uh, you know, if you guys have horsepower to write a good RFP or to like to run a, to run a study, then you know, that changes what your vendor brings and what you need from them. Um, so yeah, I, I like it as a, as a collaboration and I think you know, there's just a bunch of different uh, valves that can be opened or closed at different levels depending on what kind of works. Um, so if you have a large amount of research need, how do you prioritize sort of all the questions you have um, with, you know, the limitation of you as a human to be able to answer all of them? Hmm. Right, so you get, get in the situations where, oh, you're going to talk to some people. Oh, can you find out this? Can you find out this? Can you find out this? Right. Um, Right, it goes back to that, what's the business question, what's the research question, and what's the research method? Um, and so, you know, yeah, this, this happened to me with this small business thing where someone was, say, was interested in, um, they were interested in point of sale terminals, and we were not screening people for being retail or anything like that. And we just had to say, like, you know, that's, that's a follow-on study, because it's a different recruit. So. I think that's, that can be one way to get out of it. Like, if it's a different recruit, it's a different study. Um, but yeah, you have, to, you have to, there has to be a narrative for why you're doing this. And I think defending that, um, at, at the same time, knowing what stuff other people are interested in, I think is great. You just don't want them to have right access to your field guide, right? It's your, it's your plan that you facilitated. But knowing, um, I love going out in the field and, um, with one of my clients and they'll sort of see something they're like, oh, I gotta tell so-and-so in this group about this thing. And I think that's great for people that are doing research to be able to do, because it's a way to sort of champion the value of the research without, like that's gonna plant the seed for that person to fund the proper study to do that. So I guess don't compromise the thing that you're doing and that's why you have a plan and, and, and a brief to kind of, to, to, to draw boundaries around it. Um, at some point in your presentation, you said that um, it's not good to ask them, do you like this? But I'm not sure if you meant that it's better to like, not ask at all, yeah. or it's better to ask to gather first reaction and then you know, go more into the details of what enables you to do or why, or those things. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you got it, right? I think, um, I mean, a couple of things. One is, you can show somebody something or let them have an experience with it, and you actually don't need to say anything afterwards. You know, you, you can just turn it off or step back from it or, you know, look at them and let them start talking. Um, so one thing is if you, if you make a list of like, you know, ask them about the intro, ask them about the color, ask them about this, now you are kind of checklist surveying them as opposed to letting the thing that they're thinking first be the most relevant thing. Because um, you don't want to come back and say, nine people like this, four people like this, seven people didn't like that. You want to come back with an understanding of what the issues are. So what they choose to tell you tells you what the issues are to a certain extent. Um, and then that question, that did you like it question, is, uh, is, is a really biased question, right? Like, how's everybody liking this presentation so far? <laughs> Isn't this a great Q&A? Right, it's very hard, I mean you can try, but it's pretty hard to answer in the negative once I say that. And now I'm tying my sort of presentation of self to your assessment of the thing. So, you know, do you like it is sort of the most blatantly leading question that there is and sort of tempting to do that. So I think there's sort of two answers to that. Hi. Um. I was wondering, and I'm guessing there is no like magic number for that either. What would be the right team to come with? The right team? 
so I, th I, I do think there's a magic number, and that magic number is two people. Um, and, and so two people in the field, I think, is, is ideal. Uh, and you get to see a rapid drop off the more people that, that you bring. Um, uh, one person is not great. It's hard to run an interview by yourself. There are those moments where you go, uh, mm, uh. And so I really value this person who's next to me who has a different point of view. They don't have to be a researcher. On the Rosenfeld Media site is a, is a briefing guide that you can use to help train non-researchers to be successful. I call them like second chair, like from Law and Order, right? They're the person that kind of comes with you. Um, but w when that person has a question that I never would have thought of because I'm trying to do all this, uh, that's really, really valuable. Plus, the conversation we have in the coffee shop or in the drive home is awesome. So I really, really value that. Three people, and it's one of these things where like, it's sort of a death by a thousand paper cuts. Like you think it's okay to bring another person. Like, hey, there's gonna be three of us, no problem. And you make a worksheet and like, you're gonna take pictures, you're gonna keep quiet, you're gonna do this. Um, <coughs> and the person's really good and you run this great interview and what you don't see is what would have happened if you'd have just been two people. Like three on one, I just really believe three on one is a total different dynamic. Than, than two on one. Two on one is kind of like sitting and having coffee. Three on one is an incursion. And you know, I'm, I'm planning something right now where I think we're bringing a large group and you know, they're, all, they're, they're gonna know a large group is coming. It might be three, it might, might be as many as four. Um, part of the goal here was organizational uh, as opposed, so there's some data we need to get, but they have a lot of data and so there's just a lot of politics around it and like, I'm okay with it because that's what we're trying to do as opposed to understand something that's like really, really elusive. So, you know, I make that trade off, but I mean, I pretty much, I told them two is the ideal number and they said, well, here's the constraint. So I just, two. If you can't have the, over here, sorry. Um, if you can't have the resources or you don't have the resources to get to them and interview them in person, do you think that you can use something like Skype or Google Hangouts to interview them? And if so, how does that change any of the tips that you were giving earlier? Yeah, well, I mean, think about some of the things that I'm talking about, like you know, listening and, and really trying to make that connection with people. Think about using Skype and Hangouts with people that, right, the first 10 minutes of every one of these calls is talking about the technology. Um, and I talk about this in the book a little bit. You. Any designed experience that you send your research participant through is a risk. So do they know how to use Skype? Are they gonna be walking their dog? I mean, where are they gonna be? Um, you know, what's, what kind of signal do they have access to? Like, what environment are they in? Do they know they need headphones? You, so you, you, know, you have to design the interview for that. Um, so how much of a pain in their butt are you prepared to be in order to have it go smoothly? And you know, yes, we are getting better at using these tools. And you know, if this was four years ago, we would be talking about it differently. If it was eight years ago, we'd be talking about it really differently. Um, but I think it's just helpful to, tr to try to anticipate the situation that they're going to be in. Like, and you, look, there are all sorts of people that do this all the time. And you know, I've, I've sat in on some of these things and I've listened to them, and they. <sighs> I don't know, I'm just to be a little judgy. They lack some of the life that these, these things can happen, that, c that can happen in some of these interviews um, because the technology kind of flattens our dynamic with people. Um, that being said, like if that's the access that you have, that's the access that you have. Um, and sort of think about, you know, what might you do with that person beforehand? Um, you know, uh, like send them pictures of yourself, you know, like. How do you kind of create, start to create a connection, or what are the, what's the whole research plan going to include where this isn't the only thing? Um, you know, I think you can be kind of a little creative about it, but you know, just be prepared. It's a lot harder to, it's a lot harder to build rapport. Uh, you can't even sometimes you can't make eye contact depending on what their devices are and where they're sitting and you know where their monitor, their um, their little lenses on the top of the bezel. So, yeah, you know. I mean, you can practice this, but it's, it's an impoverished experience, so it's never going to be anything but, and you can try to optimize for it, but, um, you know, can you mix and match? Like, we can go talk to two people, and then we're going to do the rest uh, on Skype, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Oh, I have some. 
so sometimes uh, the users, I mean, in an interview, they just keep on talking and talking and talking, <laughs> and you want to bring them to a point that, you know, I mean, okay, I get it, but re I really want to know like the actual issue. So how do you like bring back to that track? And there's a couple of different uh, sort of conditions you're describing. Um, I mean, one is a person that just speaks. You ask one question, you get a very long thing. Um, and, and this happened to be an interview where I actually had to interrupt because, uh, and I, I had to interrupt, but I couldn't let my client ask any questions because each question was like a 20 minute commitment. And sometimes you were sort of just bridging and then you got sort of 20 minutes and you realize, wow, every, m I have to be very precise with every sort of utterance to kind of go where I want to go. So I really changed my style and I sort of took a pause and I, I directed her more as opposed to like, yeah, mm-hmm, follow up kind of, it was like, I didn't need to do any of that. I had to like, okay, now we're, you know, I'm looking at our time, we need to do this. I kind of, I made her my partner in getting through the interview. Um, so that's one thing. The other is, um, is people with no insight. And these people are rare. They're rare, but they do exist. And sometimes you don't realize this because they're like very affable and they're telling stories. And I talked to this guy that, um, that uh, just he told me every story about everything. And uh, he loved to go shopping. He says, uh, shopping is like an Olympic sport. We love to go to the outlet malls and it's like the Olympics for us. And I think I said, um, well, what makes it like the Olympics? Like I was looking for him to unpack that metaphor to try to get at something. And he says, we just love shopping. We just go to all the stores and we just, you know, we come back. And it was like a really, really long interview. And I, in some ways, you, you realize like, okay, we're not going to get there. And then it becomes a little bit of, I, sometimes I'm just stubborn. I'm like, well, I want to see. Like, at this point, we're here. We drove out here. We're with him. We're paying him. Like, you know, can I do this? Can I get him to offer any insight? Like, is it going to take some kind of listening for me or some different way of asking the question? Some of these questions I must have asked like just 10 different ways, you know, okay, now I understand that now, you know, if you're thinking about it this way, so help us understand and, you know, at, at the point at which you feel like you're being hostile because you've just asked the question so many different ways, you think he's just going to shake you. I already told you, it's an Olympic sport, dude. Um, and we walked out of there and we're like, I actually called the recruiter, I said, don't recruit this guy. He, I mean, it's not a thing against him, he just doesn't have any ability to reflect on himself. And, and that's not the same as being shut down and unwilling to share. So sometimes that's just, it's just people. Um, but so the tactic, I think, is to, this is why, um, I guess I think I cut the slide. There's a few slides and you can Google it. If it's not, you can find this very easily. It's called 17 Types of Interviewing Questions, um, which is somewhere in the, in the Steve Portugal Cinematic Universe. Um, and it, uh, it's a palette of questions, and that's, you need this palette of questions to come at it a different way. Well, um, and so I had one example here about role playing that I sort of skipped over, and I used that. Well, I had a, had a low insight individual um, who um, described to us how he didn't like the customer service at the store. And I said, well, what don't you like about it? Well, it's just not very good. How would you want it to be different? Well, it's just, it's just it doesn't really work out very well. And so, um, and like, so now, it, so this is in a slide and it sounds like it's a method and I'm all formal about it here, but I really just made this up. I said, okay, and I had my, my colleague there. I said, okay, um, well, let's do a little role play. Uh, Dan, why don't you be Tony? Tony was our participant. And Tony, why don't you be the customer service? Dan, why don't you call up the customer service and Tony, you know, let's have a little, little interaction. And like, we, we like picked up the little fake phone and said, ring, ring. <laughs> Right, and Tony like picked up the phone and said hello, and we sort of made this up. But the role playing and that in that case, that worked. He was able to model. It was sort of a participatory design thing. He could make one. He just couldn't tell us what the criteria for it would be. So he made one. He made a customer service experience, and then afterwards, kind of explained what it was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I made that up, but you know, just as many different ways as you can find to go at it. Now the person that, the combination of the low insight and the long talker are really bad because you can't try 80 things because now you're there three hours. So that I think is like a deadly combination, but 
If you can isolate one of those, then you can play with it a little bit more. It was a long answer, but I hope that helped. All right, let's take one last question, and then, Steve, are you up for sticking around for people to ask questions after that, one-on-one? -on -one, yes. Okay, cool. Great, and um, then we'll raffle away some books. So one last question. How do you go about recruiting people to do interview, or how do you convince strangers mm. to agree to doing interview with you without paying them? <laughs> <laughs> What's up without? Wow. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, there are people that are... Um, that are big fans of what they call intercepts or street interviews and so on. Um, I don't enjoy that. It's not my strength. Um, I don't think it gets at what we're talking about here. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things. One is arranging with somebody ahead of time, and, which is different than sort of intercepting them. So I think that's, you could intercept them as a way to schedule them for later on. I mean, you know, there are market research recruiting agencies that provide this service. And so uh, you're going to get a lot of answers. Some people are like, we only do our own. Um, some internal teams are investing in either hiring an individual to handle this, building a database or a panel or whatever it is, uh, so that every study is not starting from scratch. Um, because I'm not in-house, I'm sort of tackling this fresh every time. Um, you know, I think paying people is part of the budget. I think the, uh, and I talk about this in the book, the incentive is not salary, right? It's a, it's a really enthusiastic thank you. So swag, coffee for everybody on the floor when you come into the bank, whatever the thing is that says like, you know, uh, things that you design and print out that are little envelopes, like as ways, as many ways as you can demonstrate your enthusiasm and thoughtfulness for them you know, that $50 Amazon gift certificate that's not transactional but is sort of delivered in a way that has a lot of celebration to it says why you care about doing this with them. So, you know, giving them nothing I think is, you know, I, I, would, I would find a small budget to create an incentive and I would find a really uh, delightful way to, um, to, to deliver to them. All right. Thanks a lot, Steve. Awesome stuff. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. Good questions. All right. Thanks, Steve.